Welcome to Power Up, the uptime podcast focused on the new hot off the press technology that can change the world. Follow along with me, Alan Hall, and Itasaur's Phil Totaro as we discuss the weird, the wild, and the game-changing ideas that will charge your energy future. Well, our first idea is from Vestas, and it is an idea where they're monitoring the turbine tower loads for natural vibration frequency. And you say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, of course, as things change on a wind turbine, maybe something goes wrong, those frequencies of vibration are going to change, and the system will detect those and say, hey, something is wrong, here's probably what it is, which is a smart way of detecting failure modes in the turbine fill. But the other thing it could do is push the turbine harder if it's not being driven hard enough and creating enough power. Yeah, and this is actually really fascinating because, again, this might not sound like the world's most revolutionary, you know, innovation, but it's a practical solution to uh, a challenge that is faced out there in the field uh, when when you're operating uh, a wind farm. And specifically, you know, in addition to just monitoring the the tower loads and vibration over time, they have the option to um, monitor the max extreme load in relation to the original design load limit and readjust that max extreme load value over time as there's an evolution of, um, you know, the the uh, mechanical performance of, of the turbine. And that, to me, is a really clever way of approaching this um, challenge of having um, additional safety factor um, or, uh, as we see in the United States, where turbines get run a lot harder than they were potentially designed for sometimes because companies are trying to maximize their production tax credit revenue, this is a way for a company like Vestas to keep an eye on whether or not they're exceeding a, um, a safety criteria or by how much are you exceeding a safety criteria of, you know, the design load limit versus the max extreme load limit, which will necessarily change over time, um, you know, as components wear and, and as the tower sees, uh, you know, certain load cases on it. So I, I like this one a lot. I think, again, this is a really practical and clever thing. It might not be or sound like the world's most revolutionary uh, invention ever, but I, I like stuff like this. This is a really great one. I think it's a functional way of ensuring the safety and operation of the turbine, right? The, the ability to adjust and to understand what kind of loads are being sensed. And of course, when we talk about load changes in turbines, it's every component is completely different, right? The loads in the blades and fatigue loads over time and what can be and can't be exerted on them uh, to, you know, to look, you know, a tw like a 20 year old blade is a lot different than a one year old blade. And a 20-year-old piece of drivetrain is a lot different than a 20, you know, a one-year-old piece of drivetrain. So adjusting those load limits uh, by calculation and understanding as the turbine ages and uh, operations change, um, it's something that should actually absolutely be done. Um, so I'm, I'm with Phil. I think this is a good one. Our next idea is from GE in Spain. And GE is noted for their two-piece blades. Well, the, the issue with a two-piece blade is if you want to replace the tip, you have to physically get a crane up there and remove the tip. Well, this patent uh, allows the blade tip to be lifted and, dis and drop with a cable running through the center of the blade. So it's sort of a unique way of dropping in uh, a damaged blade tip and putting a new blade tip on. It has a sort of a coupling mechanism to carry the loads. But... Phil, this is a really slick idea. If you're going to do a two-piece blade, the reason you do that is so you can swap out the tip. You need a way to do it without involving a crane. Yeah, it, and and look, single blade swap outs an idea that's been around for like 12 or 13 years or so and, and has been commercially uh, tested and, and is commercially used by a few um, service companies and, and even EPC contractors when they're doing an initial blade install. They If they don't happen to have a crane they might be able to do the installation of a third blade um, by using a, a, 
a, either a turbine-based crane or a ground-based crane with a winch system um, that allows you to, um, you know, uh, hook up this harness uh, that'll that'll suck the blade up into the, um, you know, onto the hub. Now, this invention is for swapping out the tip, which is kind of an interesting use case on a GE Cypress blade, wherein if they happen to have either, let's say, lightning damage or, um, you know, some other kind of tip-related issue, um, they can literally debolt the... Uh, and frankly, I don't know that they successfully explained how that happens, by the way, how you get down into, um, you know, the blade deep enough to be able to, you know, unbind uh, the, the joint uh, in there to be able to, to get the tip off. Um, but once you've, you know, once you've unbolted this, uh, this tip, you know, doing a quote unquote single blade swap out with just the tip portion is, uh, is certainly a, a unique approach. So, um, you know, assuming that they can resolve some of these other operational challenges and like how you actually, you know, implement this in, from a practical standpoint, I think this is, this is interesting. Um, but like we've talked about on, you know, Power Up and the Uptime Wind Energy podcast before, not everybody's using a two-piece blade and not everybody's going to use a two-piece blade. So whether or not this uh, patented innovation gets used, you know, universally, we'll, we'll have to see. I like anything that can be done without a crane in the wind industry, without a traditional crane, right? You have the Liftra, the Liftworks, those guys doing certain things, but... Something that can be done maintenance-wise that traditionally would have taken a crane that you can't <clears throat> or that you don't have to, fantastic idea, right? The two-piece blades are built for a couple reasons, um, the main one being logistics and transportation. But the second one is is that idea that Phil has talked, that talked a little bit about, about the idea behind operations and maintenance of, hey, tip's got bad leaning edge erosion or a bad lightning damage or something, boom, just swap the tip out. It makes sense from a practical standpoint. However, have we seen it actually happen in the field? Not yet, to my knowledge. Um, if anybody has done these things, please get a hold of us so we can learn a little bit more about it. Uh, but yeah, there's some challenges there because you're going to have to probably either use a lift truck to get people up to the joint to remove the... Um, you know, they put a seal around it and some other things. And but once once you get past that, the ability to swap that tip out without a crane is could be could be uh, game changing for these two piece blades. Our last idea is a solar powered wind turbine tower, and it's from Helia Tech over in Germany. And the the patent idea goes like this: I have this long tower that sits pretty high above the ground. If I can cover that in flexible solar panels, I can generate some electricity that can go al along with the wind power being generated. So the, the really the concept is focused on the, the flexible design so it doesn't uh, have a lot of air resistance and cause the tower to rock around. This, Phil, though, doesn't seem like you'd make enough power to be worth it. Well, okay, let's start by giving some context to this. I, I will agree with that statement, but I'll come back to why in a minute. So Heliotech is a company that makes these kind of uh, flexible roll-up, almost like you're rolling up or rolling out a piece of carpet, um, these, these kind of solar panels um, that are really designed for industrial purposes, um, specifically on the top of, you know, your warehouse uh, building or other um, industrial spaces. They're meant to... Um, serve as a, a an alternative to a rack mount system, uh, a rooftop rack mount system, uh, whereby you can just physically attach these uh, solar panels, these flexible solar panels to whatever roof sur surface you happen to have. Um, now, that said, why do I not think this is a great idea for a wind turbine tower? Well, first of all, they are literally the ninth company to propose this type of invention, this, this generic type of invention uh, of mounting, you know, some kind of solar panel, flexible or otherwise, on either the tower, the nacelle, or there have been patents by people talking about literally co covering the blades with solar panels. Um, sounds like a good idea, um, but the other issue with doing this is that you don't really 
you know, it's it's an efficiency thing, right? We The reason we don't put a lot of wind turbines in the state of Florida is because it's not windy enough. And the reason that you wouldn't necessarily put these solar panels all over the, the tower is, like Alan mentioned, you're not really getting enough power out of it to... The only thing you'd be able to do with this is maybe power your, your pumps, your motors, and your fans, um, cooling fans for you know some of your electrical systems. It wouldn't allow you to black start the turbine by just using the solar power. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily provide you with, uh, you know, unless you had some kind of storage system, it wouldn't necessarily provide you with, like, backup pitch system power during a low voltage drive through or something like that. Um, so I, I just, I, it's, it's one of those things, like, you know, and, and look, companies like Asiona have done, like, actual experiments out in Spain with this, not the Heliotech system, but they, they had their own um you know, partner company come out and put, uh, you know, wrap a, a tower and solar panels. And it, it's just not something we see every day because it's just not, you know, it's not LCOE efficient. It's not cost efficient and it's not um, technically efficient uh, to, in terms of the capacity factor you get out of out of these panels. So it's it sounds like a great idea, but I I think the technology and the concept itself not worth it. And I think getting a patent on this at this point, when again, nine other companies before this have, have already gotten a patent or an application filed, uh, this, this has been proposed. It's been done. It's not great. And I'd, I'd say, let's move on. I'd like to start, um, by saying, I think that every surface that we have, uh, available in areas that it makes sense should have solar panels on them. I'm down here in Texas and all of the parking garages at every one of these airports have massive, massive coverings on them to keep the sun off your vehicles that cover acres should have solar panels on. We have a lot of buildings. We're in, I'm in Texas. Again, there's no rooftop solar here. And I believe that why not? Why wouldn't we have rooftop solar? So let's do that. However, it has to be balanced economically. Like Phil said, operations and maintenance wise, like it's a pain in the butt to maintain stuff on a tower like this. Uh, if you have them, you know, 80 meters up. Otherwise, the other side of the, that coin is, is uh, solar panels lose efficiency when they're hot. And if you're putting these on a tower, you're putting them on a steel tower. And if they're getting sunlight on the steel tower, that steel tower is hot. You're going to lose efficiency in the panels anyways. So while this may not be the best use of a technology like these flexible solar panels. I do want to say I believe we should put putting solar panels everywhere else that we can. <laughs> 